Let us move now to the second part of this morning's program, which is the discussion part of the program. We've now heard these three presentations. The idea is that we start uh, talking about them. And I think the way in which we'll proceed, we will have reactions uh, to these presentations uh, uh, by th our three afternoon speakers. Mm -hmm. And after having heard those uh, reactions, we'll move back and get a second response from the morning's uh, presenters themselves. And at that point, we will open the floor uh, to discussion with the general public. <clears throat> so let me make a few introductions uh, so we know who we are. To my left is Madeline Dungi. Madeline is a recent PhD from Harvard University. Her dissertation was on peace, power, and economic order, international rivalry and cooperation in European trade policies, 1900 to 1930. She's teaching now in Lausanne at the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, uh, where she's teaching. And she's got a whole slew of publications uh, on in, 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 the, uh, in the, what do you call it? The pipeline. The, in the pipeline. I think the one I will mention is called Writing Multilateral Trade Rules in the League of Nations, which will be coming out in contemporary uh, European history. So welcome, Madeline. Now to her left, is uh, Larry Wolf. Larry Wolf is professor at New York University, and this year he's the director of the New York University program in, uh, in Florence at La Pietro. He has written a great many books of immense interest to those of us here in Vienna. He's, his new one coming out is on Woodrow Wilson, so it relates to his talk later, but the one I want to mention is because I'm passionate about the subject, is The Singing Turk. Ottoman power and operatic emotions on the European stage from the siege of Vienna to the age of Napoleon. So welcome, Larry. And last, but by no means least, we have an old friend. We have Lothar Hobolt. Uh, uh, Lothar is a historian, professor at the University of uh, Vienna. And here, not only this is the anniversary in 2019 of these peace treaties, but last year, of course, was the anniversary of the Austrian Republic. And he wrote a book called Die Erste Republik Österreich, Das Provisorium, which has been read by most of my friends, and they really love it. So, uh, Lothar, welcome. So I think what we'll do is we'll get reactions from the three of you, and having done that, we'll go back and pick up uh, some comments uh, from the three speakers. So, Madeline, if you don't mind, why don't you take the lead? Sure. Um, well, I just have some short comments. Um, it struck me that... Um, Professor Zupan was actually, um, in a certain sense, describing how the conflict between different bases of political authority discussed by Patricia, by Professor Clavin, uh, played out on the ground. So the competition between um, economic authority, between authority based on population, and then the more traditional, old-fashioned power political hierarchies that still continue um, during the interwar period in the League of Nations. And I think you continue to see throughout the 1920s and 30s uh, claims being made on the basis of these different um, uh, forms of authority in the League of Nations. So there's a tension between them that uh, remains until the end of uh, the interwar period. And... Um, uh, I think Professor McMeekin um, showed that um, to a certain extent it wasn't diplomats uh, sort of um, making the, the borders on the ground on the basis of these abstract principles of political power. It was uh, military conflict uh, that settled the, uh, the borders that were actually put in place in 1919. But I do think that... Um, the diplomats did continue to determine how those borders were interpreted and contested throughout the interwar period. And that's, again, um, where the frameworks that were set up by Professor Supan and Professor Clavin uh, become important in the, in the interpretation of these borders that were set somewhat arbitrarily by armies in 1919. Um, so I see all the three papers fitting together really very well. Okay. My turn? Yeah. 
I also found the papers really interesting and thought they went together in really interesting ways. I wanted to make a couple of remarks. The first, um, an, we had a, a, a number of references to the Urkatastrophe, and I wanted to um, respond to that a little bit, not so much focusing on the question of whether or not it was catastrophic, um, which I think one could talk about a lot and the reasons why, but on the idea of it as an urmoment, which I think is interesting not just uh, from the point of view of historiography, but from actually looking at the discussions that take place at the peace conference in 1919. That is to say, the peacemakers themselves have a very, very strong sense that it's a foundational moment, and it's one of the things that informs their discussions um, over the course of early 1919. The idea, and it seems a little strange to us, um, that they're looking at a, a little bit of a blank, well, really, looking at a blank slate, and that European history and politics can be rewritten from a kind of year zero, right, um, in which they can recreate almost abstractly, um, almost without reference to um, peoples and borders on the ground, a new order, and that if they can get it right within a limited time frame that they have, um, that they can build something that will be stable and lasting. But working under the pressure of feeling a limited amount of time in which they have free reign to redesign um, from the ground up and without reference to um, the historical past, and sometimes without reference to the populations on the ground. And it, it responds a little bit to the fact that the peacemakers exist um, in a kind of bubble in Paris, somewhat remote from the territories that they are um, resolving um, over the course of the discussions. So this idea of this as being an urmoment is something that's very present in the minds of the peacemakers, and you find it referred to constantly in the conversations that they have during the course of the peace conference. And it's one of the things that I think um, should shape our understanding of um, how the peacemaking process works their own consciousness um, that they are doing something foundational and their own perhaps delusion that they're working from a blank slate at the moment at which the war ends and at which the empires seem to be replaceable. Um, the second point that I wanted to make um, refers to um, um, Professor Supan's um, very interesting talk and it's the punitive um, experience by both Austria and Hungary of the treaties. And what I wanted to underline here was the weird paradox that Austria-Hungary itself is not present at the peace conference. They're a peace, and, and the peacemakers are aware of this. It's something that makes them anxious that the emperor is gone. Um, he has, um, he is no longer reigning. Um, he, um, Karl, and, Karl and Zita actually leave Austria in the spring of 1919 while the peace conference is taking place. And there isn't... Had, had to leave, had to leave. They, they, well, they have, okay, they, they have to leave in March of, of, of 1919. They go to Switzerland. Um, but the, 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 the problem for the peacemakers is how to make peace with the Habsburg monarchy when there is no Habsburg monarchy to make peace with. And it also becomes problematic in dealings with the new states that include territories that were formerly part of the Habsburg monarchy, and they actually fuss over the question of what actually counts as a new state, and whether the Austrian Republic is a new state, or whether there is some continuity to Austria-Hungary, whether Hungary is a new state, or whether there is a continuity that they can work with. And by the same token, they worry over the question of whether Czechoslovakia, which is entirely made up of the former states of the Habsburg monarchy and whose um, men fought with the Habsburg army during the war to a very considerable extent, should actually in some sense be paying reparations, right, or should be receiving 
reparations. That is to say, whether they should be understood to be perpetrators or victims in this context. And the um, punitive aspects of um, Saint-Germain-en-Laye and Trianon are to a certain extent um, the accidental de facto outcomes of the fact that there is no um, representative of the um, Habsburg Austro-Hungarian government um, with whom to deal. Um, in Germany, the, of course, the Kaiser is also gone, but there's, there's a, a more clear succession between the former empire and the new republic. In the case of Austria-Hungary, it's much more ambiguous. Um, the third point I wanted to make concerns um, the Russian plans for Constantinople and Sean McMeekin's really interesting presentation. And what I what I'd want to emphasize here is that from a historian's point of view, um, the idea of the Sykes-Picot plan to um, working with the Russians to think about a post-Ottoman Middle East runs counter to a very significant tradition in British and French politics that goes back to the Crimean War, in which British and French policy had been to oppose Russian interests in the Ottoman Empire and prop up the Ottoman Empire as the a basis of political of political sta geopolitical stability in the region. And um, I, I'd want to emphasize there perhaps um, how how fragile and new that would have been for um, Sykes and Picot right now, as, you, as, you, as we might say, um, notorious for the casualness with which they were willing to contemplate a post-Ottoman future. But um, it would have been a, a fragile and notable departure from standing policy and something that the peacemakers were also aware of in um, when they came to 1919, when they no longer had a Russian ally whom they had to regard, the question of whether the demolition of the Ottoman Empire was, um, was, a, was a fundamental and important piece of policy was something that the peacemakers sometimes had different ideas about during the peacemaking process. Um, in relation to that, um, again, one of the things that, um, that came up was the question of the Greek presence in Anatolia. And I wanted to um, talk back to at least a piece of that. That is to say, I hesitate over the question of whether Wilson was really so enthusiastic about the Greek invasion of Anatolia. That is, to sem that is um, it's something that the, I mean, Wilson has um, some ties of sentiment and in interest in Venezuelos. Um, regards him as a sympathetic, a sympathetic figure. Um, but I think that both, that Wilson, along with the other principal peacemakers, both Lloyd George and Clemenceau, again, are of two minds and have some hesitations about the Greek army as they do about the Italian army in Anatolia, even though the Italian claims are much more, are, are, are more fictive if any, if that, than any Greek claims could possibly be based on, based on ethnography. And the, they hesitate about it, I think, for the same reason that they hesitate about the um, Romanian and Czech armies that are present in Hungary, just to connect this again to Professor Supan's talk. Um, and they hesitate about it because it's a case of armies that are removing the decisions out of the control of the peacemakers in Paris, when armies actually make themselves known and um, carve out little pieces of post-imperial territory for themselves, as the Romanians and the Czechs do in Hungary, as the Greeks and the Italians attempt to do in post-Ottoman territory, it's something that removes from the control of the peacemakers the opportunity to create what they see as this foundational piece that they themselves can um, control, manipulate the parts of from Paris, all as a unified whole. And I would see them as being less excited about the Greek um, presence, as perhaps nervous about it and its implications for them as peacemakers. Um, and then the fourth thing that I wanted to reference was um, Professor Supan's um, account of um, the American professor Coolidge on the ground 
in Corinthia. Um, I think he says at some point, far exceeding his, his orders and his brief in um, attempting to resolve the Yugoslav-Austrian border in advance of a plebiscite, um, trying to make those kinds of decisions. One of the things that's interesting about it is that the peacemakers in Paris, as I've said, are in a kind of a bubble and are to a very considerable extent removed from the territories that they are um, attempting to resolve and have very limited experience of those territories themselves. Um, Coolidge's role is a really interesting one, both as um, a a, someone who's present on the ground in the region and supplying information to Paris, but also as someone who is an academic expert. And this is, of course, very interesting to those of us who are academic as, experts, because one of the things that's striking about the conference is the ways in which academic expertise um, comes to play a role and also does not um, play um, uh, roles at, at, cru at, at crucial moments. But one of the long-term consequences of the conference is the foundation of area studies in these relevant disciplines concerning the territories that are under discussion at the Paris Peace Conference. And the case of Coolidge is a particularly striking one. He's the founding figure for thinking about Eastern Europe in American academics. His student, who was also working um, for the Peace Conference, all of these people are caught up, by the way, in Colonel House's inquiry operation, which is the, um, the operation that mobilizes academic ex expertise in advance of the Peace Conference. But Coolidge's student, um, Robert Kerner, is um, responsible for thinking about um, both Czech issues and Yugoslav issues at the conference and um, provides a certain amount of academic expertise. He's Pardon? Disinformation. Disinformation at its best. But what I would say about Kerner is Kerner then goes back to the United States, um, becomes the founding professor of Eastern European history at the University of California, Berkeley, where his student is Wayne Vucinich, whom um, Professor Supan and I both knew well, his student, Wayne Vucinic, was my PhD professor. So in four generations, you go from Coolidge and the experts at the Paris Peace Conference to myself in four, in four academic generations. And most of American academic expertise um, concerning Eastern Europe would follow a similar sort of filiation. Thank you. Now, I believe I do have a well-reserved re reputation as a contrarian, but to my shame, I must admit, I find little to criticize in all three papers. I just want to come back, first of all, on your point about Keynes' mother. Please do enlighten us about her influence on the economic consequences and any other. I'm really curious about that. And I want to uh, go on from what Larry said, the Ur catastrophe. You, you've sort of concentrated on the Ur, on the seminal. I want to sort of draw attention to the word catastrophe. Because usually after a war, I mean, obviously the losers think it's a catastrophe. Hmm. No, no big surprise. But the thing about World War I, basically, is uh, no one really is all that happy with the results. I mean, that is the funny thing. I mean, in 1870, that would have been a very much a catastrophe for the French. But for Bismarck, it was glorious, the founding of the empire. Now, you might even say 1918 was the founding of the American empire, in a way. But the Americans aren't too happy about it. They think they've been tricked into the war. And none of the others is too happy either. So this idea that no one really won the war, hmm, that's question mark. That's an important one. And it leads us to another question, war guilt, which is a completely anachronistic term. I mean, up to 1914, no one is in the least questioning the supreme right of sovereign states to start and lead and conduct wars. Cosi fan tutte. Everyone does that. I mean, the Serbs are so proud of having smashed the Ottoman Empire in Europe a few years ago. Italy is sort of taking her grab. Uh, all the others are fighting colonial wars. Uh, the thing is, usually that's because there's something in it to win. It's only after World War I that we no longer write books about the origins of this or that conflict, but the war guilt question that dominates, you know, debates for decades. That's an interesting one, and it has to do with a sort of different shape of, of events on the ground 
It's no longer a few mercenaries who are happily killed in far off lands because you don't want the foreign legion to actually come back home. They'd be dangerous. So it's quite good if they have casualties. But it's your own people being killed in millions. And then with the war guilt, of course, you have the suitable pretext uh, for reparations. And reparations are a suitable pretext to find somebody who will pay your war debt to the US. And on top of that, you have this French idea that we've invested 20 billion francs in Russia, and that's all gone now. So somebody has to pick up the tab. And then, of course, if you analyze the war guilt question in a little bit of detail, you find that the two great powers who most to do with the outbreak of war are Austria, Hungary, and Russia. And they are both gone. So if you tell the French electorate, L'Autriche payera tout, you'll be thrown at with rotten eggs, you know? So yeah, it has to be Germany because no one else is in the least able to pay. I mean, not even Germany is supposed to do that then. But that is sort of the, the thing, the picture of war as a legitimate means of, of politics. Of course, it doesn't get carried away, but at least it's questioned in a way it's hardly ever been before. You might say a little bit the Revolutionary Wars, Napoleon, they have provided an inkling of that. And the big thing about the peace conference, I do think it was, World War I was a seminal catastrophe, but it's completely wrong to blame its consequences on the peacemakers. The important thing, I think he summed up, Margaret Macmillan quotes that in her big book, Arthur Balfour, who was sort of great one for slightly deprecatory remarks about others. When he said, those three all powerful, all ignorant men, you know, the big three, uh, Wilson, Clemenceau, and Lloyd George. Now, whether they're really all that ignorant, we were discussing about the information fed to Wilson, you know, compared with present day statesmen, I think they, they are high order philosophically. I mean, uh, I'd exchange Macron for Clemenceau every day, but never mind. Uh, the big thing is they weren't all powerful. I mean, you talked about events on the ground. The Allies are demobilizing very rapidly. I mean, Foch has an army of 200 divisions at the end of 1918, and by the spring of 1919, he's down to 40. Mm -hmm. They simply cannot no longer get things done. And I'll talk in, in Russia, when they want to intervene in Russia, they are talking of, can't we find a few Bulgarians to fight for us? Or something like that, you know? They can no longer do it on their own. And that shapes sort of the range of their abilities. I mean, the thing, New World Order, the big thing is there are so many things which they couldn't care less and they know they can't do anything about it. And just two brief uh, one-liners sort of about the specific Austrian situation and the question sort of that feeds into, uh, for Arnold, we all was, you know, in, in the Austrian sort of national narrative, uh, German Austria, the name was abolished, and we all think it's because too German. I think it's the other way around. It's because if you have a German Austria, by logical implication, you have a non-German Austria too, somewhere. And that's what the Czechs and the others and the Slovenes resent. They don't want Austria as an overarching idea to be somehow present. And I think that's why the name of German Austria sort of gets done away with. And the other thing, I mean, we, we don't disagree, but just this unclosed question, of course, and we know the end of the war came a little bit as a surprise. It came too sudden, so not all these plans were sort of properly laid. Now, there are some people in, in France, actually, and in Britain, too, who think, why not let Anschluss happen? It'll come about sooner or later. But if the German Reich gets another six to 10 million Germans from the southeast, the obvious solution is we'll take away another six to 10 million Germans elsewhere. And so for the Berlin government, it's not a question of do we want the Austrians. Sooner or later, we might. But it's a question of if we take the Austrians now, we lose six million Rhinelanders in return. And they say an emphatic no to that. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Lothar. So let's, we will have the responses now. So Patricia, let's hear about Keynes's mother. Keynes's mother, yeah, I'm very happy to start with Keynes's mother, really, because she is one of a series of women who are also extremely active in the peacemaking process of 1919. Women in many countries, including here, get the vote, and quite a lot of that suffrage energy, now you've got the vote, is actually want to change the world in which you live. Traditionally, we think that that energy goes into national politics, so it starts to shape 
in Britain, uh, not in France, because of course French women don't have the vote, uh, but in the Weimar Republic too, new social and economic agendas. But it's also very important to the peacemaking process and it feeds very directly and it's, it's, very, it's great to be able to tell this story here in Vienna in the context of the hunger and disease that's gripping Central and Eastern Europe in 1919. So the Women's International League of Peace and Freedom, of which uh, Ada, Florence Ada Keynes' mother is a member, is very active in agitating for the provision of food and medical care for the children in Central and Eastern Europe. Florence Keynes, also Margaret Keynes, are good friends of um, uh, Eglantine Jeb, who's the founder of the Save the Children Fund. And the Save the Children Fund is one of the very first non-governmental organizations, also develops uh, the Charter for the Rights of the Child, which is a, a, a charter that is incorporated into the League of Nations in 1929, but is also foundational for UNICEF. Both of these bodies, of course, still continue today. And their case is very strongly around the fact that the economic and social consequences of the peace are provoking mass hunger in Central Europe and particularly affecting the fate of small children. And the very first campaign that Florence Keynes, Margaret Keynes, and Eglantine Jeb are involved in, along with Dorothy Buxton, is here in Vienna. And it then feeds out into Austria more broadly. And throughout this process, Keynes is working on Austria's reparations settlement, not Germany's reparations settlement, when he resigns from the British government. And, he, and it's his mother who's writing to him to say, Maynard, what are you going to do about these starving children? And what's interesting, too, in the historiography is that that part of the correspondence, her letters to him, are never published. You just get his letters saying, I'm very worried about the fate of uh, famine, or the problem of famine, in Central and Eastern Europe. So it's also something that historians actually have missed in some senses. There's a lot of women's agency in and around these problems. And it takes me really to a, I'm happy to talk about it more, but I could talk about it for hours, so I'll, I'll finish that story there. It takes me to some of the other issues that uh, the three very helpful commentaries have picked up. Um, the, the first one is really the, the problem of um, the changing nature of war in this process, really. I think that's one of the things that the peacemakers are also trying to grasp in the conscription of, I mean, mass armies is a European, a, a more of a phenomena associated with continental Europe, but for Britain, it has very far-reaching consequences for the way that war can be used as an instrument of state policy and also for the structure of the welfare state. So in reparations, part of it is always this discussion around widows' pensions. Why is it that we have to worry about widows' pensions? Well, of course, it's in order to persuade men to fight in, at a time when you're also beginning to develop an argument that the family wage, the wage not just to each individual in a family, but that you have a male breadwinner. So in order, if you lose the male breadwinner while he's fighting, you then have to provide a pension for the family that's left behind. So this dynamic of the changing state structure nationally feeds up very quickly into this changing international structure and expands enormously the reparations question. And of course, it also provides the wall guilt clause because you have to have a legal basis for that. And that sort of takes me to the other point I want to make, which is that the peacemaking and this sort of operation and creation of treaties in a vacuum, in a bubble, at the very top of government is also something that's then transferred and incorporated into the League of Nations. So the legal, the covenant of the League of Nations is the foundation, founding piece of international law, but it's also that this international organization inherits whole sets of treaties that are contradictory. So on the one hand, it's a foundational moment. On another, it's sort of this mess is then handed to the League of Nations and told, now you guys try and sort it out. Uh, and that's, that's the, the senior politicians in a way are not aware of it. They are in this bubble, but they're also not going to be so responsible for trying to sort this mess out. The people who are much more critical are some of the administrators on the ground, some of the people that I touched on. But also, if I think about it in terms of the food um, relief agency here in Austria that then also expands across Central and Eastern Europe. They have the, this body called the American Relief Administration, which is headed by Herbert Hoover, a future president of the United States. And in the correspondence of Hoover's officials, you get this real sense of rage from them about the terms of the peace and also then when the Americans disappear off 
the scene. And some of them go on to work for the League of Nations. So you don't actually have to be a, you can work for this organization, unlike the UN. You don't have, your state doesn't have to be a member of it. You can still participate as an expert in some of these problems. So uh, it's um, this sort of interconnection of laws and also a kind of Mittelschicht, a, a, a middle range of officials and administrators of the peace. It's also something we don't know as much as we could in terms of the story that, that, that Sean told about what's happening on the ground and then this very high level story of the way that, that um, officials interreact. Um, and I think I'll leave my remarks there for now. Thank you. <coughs> uh, Larry uh, mentioned the punitive element in the peace treaties. Let me erase this a little bit. Why so punitive against Austria and punitive against Hungary? Um, looking to Austria, uh, there is no doubt that the Anschluss question was the most important uh, for France. Uh, looking to the map and to the, the facts and figures, in the case of uh, an Anschluss of German Austria uh, to the Weimar Republic, the Weimar Republic would be stronger in Europe, uh, even with the losses in the East and the West. So it's uh, very easy to compare this. And this Anschluss question remained in the French uh, politics and the French diplomacy. Um, of course, uh, the, the, the whole uh, interwar period after 38, and um, the, the French historian uh, Georges Henri Soutou wrote in a new, uh, a new book um, the, sit uh, the situation after the fall of the Berlin Wall and uh, the ten points of uh, uh, Chancellor Kohl. Uh, Mitterrand asked uh, his advisors, and what's about Austria? Uh, what's about the Anschluss now in, in November 1989? Yeah, so you see this long lasting sinking uh, of the uh, French against an uh, Anschluss. And uh, looking, uh, looking to the debates in, in Paris, uh, this uh, German. Um, the fear from Germany, even from the new Germany, was also important uh, for the border <clears throat> making between Czechoslovakia and Germany. Uh, when uh, some US uh, advisors, diplomats, and even Lloyd George uh, discussed this with the Czechs, um, what to do with the uh, German Bohemians, German Moravians, the Silesians, um, the, the, the French uh, argument was, we, we, cannot, we cannot give Germany now more uh, of uh, German population, um, especially in this rich province with uh, mines and uh, 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 industries, uh, etc. Um, it's out, out of thinking. Um, looking, and it's interesting, this argument uh, did not play a, a role, of course, in the border making to Yugoslavia. Uh, and uh, therefore, the, the proposal of Coolidge with his mission, etc., uh, influenced uh, Wilson. Obviously, Professor Coolidge and uh, Professor Wilson um, had a similar thinking and trusted each other not always between professors, but uh, it, it happened in this, in this moment. And uh, Coolidge uh, didn't influence the US thinking um, belonging to uh, Karinsa, but also belonging to uh, Western Hungary, to the Burgenland. And Coolidge made also the proposal to um, uh, annex uh, Southern Moravia to the new Austria, but he was not successful with this uh, proposal. So um, the influence of Coolidge is, uh, was, was really important, and uh, thanks, Larry, that uh, you explained this, <laughs> uh, the, the, the long chain of, uh, uh, of uh, the influence of Coolidge over Körner uh, and, and uh, uh, Vucinic, uh, et cetera. Um, looking to Hungary, why, why the Allied powers punished Hungary? There are two other points, and not so the German question, of course, 
first the military occupations in November, December 1918. Um, the, the Serbian armies uh, were not confronted with, uh, with resistance in southern Hungary, even not, even not in the occupation of Pech, with the rich coal mines there. Uh, the Romanian uh, divisions coming from the east after the Mackensen army uh, uh, was brought home to Germany uh, didn't, uh, didn't uh, meet a, a strong resistance by the Hungarians. Only in Slovakia was then uh, the resistance by the, by the Red Army. Uh, so the Allied powers accepted the result more or less of these military occupations and uh, Milleron, Alexander Milleron, in his note to the uh, Hungarian government in May 1920, uh, uh, stressed this, uh, this, this fact of the military occupation that, uh, that there were no resistance against. And the second and very important point was, of course, the Bolshevism in Hungary. Uh, the, um, the decision making uh, happened uh, especially in June 1919 when uh, there were still uh, the Bolshevik government of uh, Bela Kuhn, and uh, um, Smuts was sent, uh, General Smuts was sent there in, in April and, and, and hated this Bolshevist and told this then uh, coming back to Paris. So um, fighting against the, uh, the, the Bolshevists uh, was used then by the Serbs, by the Romanians, <coughs> by the Czechoslovaks in the argument uh, uh, making, uh, making the new borders uh, of Hungary. To the um, question of uh, Lota, um, of course the war guilt uh, question played then in the propaganda of the Nazis a, a very uh, a great role. Uh, why, why the Allied um, demanded from Austria to um, uh, expel the, the German, uh, the word German. Now, I think uh, um, the main point was to separate, to clear separate Austria from uh, Germany. Uh, and uh, uh, so with the, with the answers question behind. Um, but uh, we, should, we should look in the, in the French papers uh, what was the, the main argument. I don't think that uh, the argument of the, of the Czechs and the Slovenes was so important in this, in this moment. Uh, it, was, it was always the German element, or, or with Germany, Germany, uh, and the fear, the French fear from a, a new Germany um, striking back one time against, against the new France. Thank you. All right. Um, well, I'll try not to go on for too long. I'm sure all of you would love to jump in at some point. Um, but just briefly, uh, I'll, I think I'll start with a couple of the interesting uh, points that Larry made. Um, uh, one of which was about the almost the unnatural nature of this relationship between uh, Russia and the Western powers and the carving up of the Ottoman Empire. It's quite right, in fact. I mean, this is a, it's a big theme I talk about in some of my other books on the origins of the war, uh, several of which were actually published in German, so I can give a brief plug. Uh, Russland's Weg in den Krieg, which is actually a better title than the one Harvard came up, up with, which was r the Russian origins of the First World War. Harvard wanted to sex that one up to make that into a Russian war guilt book, which it really was not supposed to be, but it did get some attention. Um, and then Countdown to War, July 1914, which was oddly enough published as Countdown in den Krieg. I hadn't known that Countdown was a German word um, until that book came out. But one of the themes that I talk about is, is how in many ways artificial this relationship was. Britain and Russia quite famously had been adversaries all from the 19th century, the so-called Great Game, much of which had to do, of course, with you know, the long, landward routes to India. Uh, there was the famous partition agreement, uh, mostly remembered because of Persia, because of Iran, the Anglo-Russian Accord of 1907, although of course there were also agreements pertaining to the Hindu Kush, and even Afghanistan and Tibet. Uh, it was meant to put the great game on ice. It didn't really. In fact, by 1914, uh, Britain and Russia were at loggerheads over Iran and the zones of influence in Iran. And the to the extent there was any alliance at all, it was on the verge of breaking apart. The French were in a panic, actually, to keep Britain and Russia from essentially divorcing. Uh, of course, Britain and France, it was a little strange, they were allies too. I mean, they had been allies in the Crimean War, but they'd been enemies for centuries. And the Crimean War, just briefly, because it's, it is such an interesting contrast, one of the points I often make, 
Uh, you know, you talk about the diplomacy, much as I talk about boots on the ground, diplomacy is extremely important in, shall we say, arranging um, the array of belligerents. So that whereas, of course, in the Crimean War, Russia was up against the Ottoman Empire, Britain, France, and oddly enough, Piedmont, Sardinia, somehow by 1914, Russia had cajoled Britain and France into supporting her own imperial ambitions. Again, we're always hearing about Britain and France, but how is it that the two erstwhile adversaries of the Crimean War had suddenly become adjuncts of Russian imperialism in the Ottoman Empire in the Near East? It's, it's quite a remarkable story. I mean, the most obvious explanation is the rise of Germany and German power and everyone just kind of losing their minds a little bit, not unlike the way people lose their minds these days because of Putin or Trump. Everyone was kind of losing their minds because of Germany. It was quite artificial. Um, it was quite unnatural. Uh, you know, Britain had seen Russia as an adversary. In fact, to, to bring it back to the story I was talking about earlier with, with the partition agreement, the reason uh, I, I mentioned the, the part about oil in northern Iraq, that's why the British decided they wanted Mosul and eventually they wanted to keep the French out of Syria. The other point I didn't mention is that the reason they had assigned Syria to France in the first place was largely to have a buffer zone against Russia because most of the British kind of the, you know, the, the, the greatest minds in the imperial establishment still saw Russia as a long-term adversary. Then when Russia fell out, there was no more reason to give French Syria because, well, after all, there's no need for a buffer anymore because the Russians weren't there. So that's yet another reason why there was such a to-do over Syria is because Britain, again, was still thinking about Russia as a long-term enemy. Now, briefly on Wilson, I, I hope I didn't give the impression he was really an enthusiast of the Greek invasion. <laughs> I might have implied that. It was more a matter of Wilson, I think, being manipulated by Lord George into temporarily green lighting it, you might say, against his better instincts. Um, one of many occasions in which Wilson, you might say, let the kind of more cynical old world statesman get the better of him. Lloyd George was an enthusiast. There's simply no doubt about that. It's not simply he was a, a kind of patron of Venizelos, the Hellenic cause. His career was actually in part financed by a Greek shipping magnate called Basil Zaharoff. He had long and deep connections to Venezuelos and uh, the Greek nationalists. Um, now, Madeleine made an interesting point about diplomats against kind of soldiers on the ground. And it's true, I was, as a natural born contrarian, I was trying to point out not the impotence of diplomats, but to some extent their exaggerated ability to shape the final settlement on the ground. And I do stick by that point. I will say the one exception to that rule in the story I was telling earlier um, happened at Lausanne with the notorious population exchange uh, of Greeks and Turks, or really as many of them thought of themselves at the time, of course, Muslims and Christians. A uh, far larger number of Greek Christians, of course, left or were expelled or fled the Ottoman Empire than vice versa, but there were still about 400,000 Turkish Muslims who were actually expelled from Greece. Um, now, interestingly, this was actually both arranged, negotiated, and then essentially kind of sanctioned by this formal international agreement. It was, essentially, it was legal ethnic cleansing. Now, amazingly enough, the man who largely negotiated it, I just flew through Norway, so I was reminded of him, Fritjof Nansen, was actually given the Nobel Peace Prize for his role in helping to cleanse Greece and Turkey of minorities. Shows you a little bit about the different world of the early 1920s. Um, in defense of these statesmen, of course, they were trying to not only settle the war, which had been smoldering on and off for over a decade, but also to solve a massive refugee crisis, which was quite serious. In many ways, in fact, the Greco-Turkish War of 1919 was just kind of like round two of the war, which had begun in the Balkan Wars, which had, oddly enough, was about to break out in June 1914 again, shortly before Sarajevo. Uh, Greece, and Turk, uh, Greece had actually just sent an ultimatum to Turkey. It had to do with the mistreatment of Greeks in Asia Minor. So the diplomats there, they did play a role. One could say it was perhaps humanitarian, perhaps malign, um, but they helped to arrange forcible, legal, ethnic cleansing. Uh, final remark, just very briefly, that, that Lothar, uh, he made many interesting comments about kind of the war almost in this, in this broader perspective, you know, no one won the war. I would submit that at least Serbia and Romania did very well out of the First World War. <laughs> the case of Romania, of course, is quite amusing in that they essentially didn't win a battle and had to flee and they, they sent their national uh, treasures, reserves, and gold to Russia for safekeeping shortly before the Russian Revolution. 
which didn't work out very well for them. Um, but they did gain a lot of territory, as did, of course, Serbia. And the reward, of course, was that both countries were punished heavily in the Second World War when their jealous and angry and revanchist neighbors invaded them in retaliation. I think that's the last thing I'll say here. Well, thank you, thank you all. I think at this point we can open the floor for discussion. I would ask a couple of ground rules here. Firstly, it's important that you identify yourself. And above all, you must ask a very quick question uh, and do not make any lengthy uh, statements or, or, or questions. Gus, I think we have one here on the, on, in the front. Wolfgang Helper, I run a risk advisory consultancy. And I would like to ask Professor McNeekin uh, to elude a little bit on the transition process from uh, Sèvres to Lausanne, during which Kurdistan got lost. Ah, yes, the ever the ever fading or, or lost proposition of, of Kurdistan or autonomous Kurdistan. Um, it, it was somewhat lost. I mean, it was a little bit lost in the shuffle at Versailles, a little bit lost in the shuffle even at Sèvres, with this vague language about an autonomous Kurdistan. Larry was actually asking me in the interim here about autonomous from what, which is a very good question. Um, so far as I understand the legal nature of this autonomy, I think it was supposed to be an autonomous area or region in what was to become the rump version of the ex-Ottoman Empire or rump Turkey. Um, and that in itself was, of course, problematic. Um, the Kurds were one of many groups that were vying for control in what is now called Anatolia, then called various different things, whether you're talking about Kurdistan or Western Armenia, uh, former Ottoman Empire, Eastern Turkey, a lot of different names for the various areas that were being fought over. Um, we, we heard an interesting point actually from, from Lothar about troops on the ground, the problem even in the Russian Civil War, the problem was there in the Ottoman Empire too. The French, for example, the French didn't really have troops for either their claims in the Russian Civil War or in Turkey, and so they were largely sending in people like Senegalese, or you know, they were sending in the case of Cilicia, they actually sent in the Armenian Legion um, which, of course, was just as explosive as you could possibly be as far as the, the counter-reaction of, of the Turks would be. And in the case of the Greeks, you know, again, they ended up reinforcing their troops. Um, they were actually implicitly helped, not, not, not just implicitly, but the, the Greek troops who arrived in Smyrna in 1919, and then the Greek troops, the last ones, which actually left from Cheshme in 1922, most of them actually came in and left upon British naval vessels. So it was pretty clear who was really behind that intervention. Certainly the Turks had no illusions on that score. The French and the Italians, I mean the Italians to some extent were a little bit like the Americans were the longed for occupier because everyone thought they might have been the nicest or the most generous. And because they didn't come, the Italians sort of played that role by default. There's a very elegant novel by Louis de Bernier, which I highly recommend. He's more famous for Captain Corelli's Mandolin because it was made into that treacly movie with Nicolas Cage and Penelope Cruz. But the novel I'm talking about, Kanatsis Kuschlar or Birds Without Wings, is a very elegant literary appreciation of the various dilemmas involved in, in that period, among others, um, in which it, it's essentially, it's a mythical town loosely based on Fetier, where the Italians come in. And of course, everyone's quite bewildered, and there's no common language. And in the end, I suppose, they settle on a kind of like pigeon made up French, you know, where they're the, one of the local Ottoman Turkish landowners speaks a bit of French, and he speaks a bit of French. And, and in the end, the Italians just decided that they would cut these deals earlier than anyone else. And then the French started cutting deals with the Turks, largely despite the British. Um, so the, the French, in the end, had to play some triage in order to simply control Syria and, and in turn expel Faisal, who is seen as Britain's client from Syria, who went, ended up taking over Iraq instead. Uh, what the French uh, largely did is they cut their own deal with Kemal, as did the Bolsheviks. And we shouldn't forget that the Bolsheviks actually saw Kemal as an ally. And so they sent actually gold and arms to Mustafa Kemal and the Turkish nationalists, largely, of course, despite uh, the Western imperialists. And, and that strange, improbable friendship between Bolshevik Russia and Kemalist Turkey actually endured really right into the mid-1930s. So everyone was scrambling, you know, for the scraps. It was a very complicated situation. And the Kurds, in the end, they just didn't have, they didn't have enough friends and allies. I think the most important part of that equation is that if there was anyone who knew the Kurds as a people, who knew the Kurdish languages, who knew the tribal chieftains, and had relationships with them, it was the old Russian imperialists. And they no longer existed. You know, basically that old white Russia, whatever, czarist Russian regime, the old diplomatic establishment of Russia, 
uh, the foreign ministry, and to some extent in the military, no longer existed. Okay, Gus, we have a question here in the second row. Uh, I'm Gertrude Ullmark. Do you hear me? Yeah, I think you should. I have a question. I have a question for uh, Professor Hubert. First, I understand that the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy was, of course, a main uh, actor in starting World War One. I. I don't understand Russia. Second, you said that the Weimar Republic would have lost the Rhineland Germans had they taken on Austria at that time. I also why. Yeah, the question about, I mean, Austria-Hungary is obviously starting the war, but the question to be asked about it is, the general background to 1914 is the central powers assume that they stand a chance, 50-50 at least, of winning the war now. But within three years, with the end of the French rail building program in Russia, they no longer stand a chance. And that was an assumption that was more or less shared by all the general staffs in Europe. Now, that being so, you would have expected the Russians to tell the Serbs, kids, wait three more years and we've got them in the bag, you know? Why start the war now? And there are all sorts of reasons, I, I suppose connected with Constantinople and all that, why the Russians actually say, no, we start the war now. I mean, Dominic Levin, who says, I'm related to all of them, they're simply too bloody-minded. <laughs> Whatever. So, but what I wanted to say is, Germany and France, they're both such vain nations. They would never anybody believe, let anybody believe that they had no proper share in it. Now, they're even bidding for the guilt, you know. It's, it, it's their self-importance, you know. <laughs> Things can't happen without us. No crime on the earth where the Germans aren't involved. This is sort of a point of pride. And the French, you know, who are no longer a great power, always want to be part of it. No, in 1914, it's the Austrians, the Russians, with all the Balkan allies who do it. And the other one, the Rhineland, I mean, there are no exact plans about that, but those were the apprehensions of the German leadership. If we do Anschluss now, because actually these negotiations are going on before the final peace settlement, before these clauses are in inscribed, so they'll make us lose something else. And there were French voices, and I'm quite sure in newspaper articles too, who suggested exactly that. All right, the Anschluss, we can't prevent it. We're too far from it. But why not take the Rhineland, which the British said we shouldn't do? Okay, Ni Nicolo, we have a question here in the uh, one, two, three, fourth row. Reinhard Zimmermann, I um, have been interested in uh, external foreign relations since uh, 40 years, uh, so, and I've applied twice for the Austrian ministry for, uh, to become a diplomat, but I failed. But I'm coming here regularly. So, um, easy to answer question for the panel, certainly. One, um, were they, uh, um, Austria and Hungary the only defeated nations which were not uh, allowed to participate in the uh, talks? First question, uh, in Paris, 1918-1919. And the second question, is um, um, France always spoke against the um, access, uh, accession of Austria to, the, to Germany, but uh, did France really help in early March 1938? Uh, when I heard that recently, um, the Austrian government wrote a letter for help to the French government, and they did say, no, we have no uh, a fixed government, only a pre preparatory one, provisionary one. Thank you. The first question is very easy. Uh, all the five losers were not invited uh, to Paris before May uh, 1919. Uh, and as I said, uh, the most um, uh, decisions were made uh, even belonging to Austria and to Hungary without negotiations. Um, uh, a specific question was, uh, should they invite Russia, Soviet Russia? There was a debate um, uh, between the Allied powers, and uh, as a compromise uh, came the, the, the proposal uh, to make uh, specific negotiations um, on a 
island in the Marmara Sea, uh, so close to uh, Istanbul, Constantinople, but the Russians uh, denied this, uh, this proposal from uh, March 1990. <clears throat> so this was a, a great mistake, uh, making a peace treaty without concrete negotiations uh, and when the, the losers uh, came uh, to Paris, uh, they uh, received the drafts and can only make uh, uh, script uh, counter proposals uh, in, the, in, the, in this kind. Um, your second question is also relatively easy to answer. Um, in, the, in the moment of February uh, 1938 was a the next uh, government crisis in Paris, uh, and uh, the, the main uh, Western power was, uh, was Great Britain, and, uh, and uh, the British government told Shushnik it's impossible for us uh, to, uh, to intervene, uh, uh, especially after, after the humiliation of Shushnik uh, in uh, Berchtesgaden, so in the Berghof, uh, and uh, after the um, uh, the July agreement from 1936. Uh, yeah. So there was no, no debate, uh, no strong debate, and uh, therefore the, the, the Anschluss uh, was relatively easy uh, for Hitler. He didn't see this so, but at the end it was uh, the result uh, that uh, France didn't, uh, didn't react, even not with a strong protest. I just wanted to add a little, a little note uh, to that, that, descript, that characterization because one of the things that's very strong in the British government from very early on is this debate about whether Austria alone is viable. And that's the, is it Lebensfähig? And that's the case, of course, the Austrians themselves make. So that over time really takes hold inside the Foreign Office and more broadly. So it's also then why, you would, why would you jump to the defense when in fact Anschluss was the mistake that was made in 1919, it should have been allowed to happen. Yeah, of course, the Lebensweg debate was always used to blackmail the Western powers into giving us money, you know. You prevented us from getting money from the Germans, so you give us money yourself, you know. This is, this is a very curious phenomenon. And of course, the Lebensweg question, even in Austrian parliament, they said, Lebensweg, of course, but on what a level? I mean, even the pan-Germans said, of course we're Lebensfähig, at the niveau of the Albanians, but do we want that? And uh, in 1938, the question, the French had long made up their minds, Austria is the interest fear of the Italians. Why should we pull Mussolini's chestnuts out of the fire for him? I mean, if they don't do anything, why should we? Okay, we've got another question up here, Nicolo, in the first, second, third row. And then, um... Harold Otto, an academic, a non-academic interested in history. And I have two questions. The first is related to domestic or national politics. And Professor Clavin brought it up some, Professor McMeehan brought it up some, uh, shaping what was happening inside the so-called bubble in Versailles. And particularly referring to Colonel uh, House from the US. He was uh, a political master in Texas. He was interested in the Democratic Party's future, which is this coalition between the South and urban ethnics. Germans in the U.S. had been politically demobilized in World War I. So you had the Slavs that were very powerful. How strong was those interests in his decisions in place of Wilson uh, in Versailles? That's kind of one question. And related to that is the power of Herbert Hoover's, not Herbert Hoover's, but the American relief to Middle Europe and how that shaped the domestic poli politics within Middle Europe, as all of a sudden people were getting food from the U.S., clearly branded from the U.S. U.S. actors were controlling the rolling stocks and the rails uh, and making a lot of political decisions on the ground in Middle Europe. And then just a, a quick question to the idea that Professor Hobart brought up, the surprise of anti-war sentiment after World War I. Uh, the Nobel Peace Prize winner from Austria uh, Bertha von Suttner had been working for decades to build a mass movement against war. You had the Hague Convention, where it was a general idea that war was bad, then World War I happened. And so you had a big sentiment uh, that war was bad before, because of, uh, I just question, I'm, I'm giving, uh, 
her credit for putting this in the intellectual air. Okay, who would like to go first? Uh, the, role of, the role of Hoover was uh, very important uh, to help uh, uh, the Central Europeans uh, coming out of this uh, terrible winter of 1918-1919. And there's a uh, Austrian uh, section head, uh, Schiller uh, wrote, the, the only one uh, who helped us in this, in this terrible winter was Herbert Hoover and the Quakers. <laughs> yeah? uh, without, uh, without them, uh, uh, Vienna, uh, in, in Vienna, 10,000 people uh, would, would be died more, even more, uh, with hunger and, and cold, uh, uh, etc. So the role of, of Hoover is still uh, underestimated in the international historiography I would say, in the international historiography on the, on the peace treaties. Uh, Hoover was the general director of the relief, uh, sitting, I think, in, in Brussels more than in, in Paris, and sending, sending uh, many uh, uh, advices to Central Europe, for example, to deliver coal uh, from uh, Silesia to Vienna, um, Goodyear, Goodyear was one of the experts doing this, yeah. uh, and uh, we should we should think on the role of Hoover and his and his helpers uh, more than uh, than uh, uh, today. The role of Colonel House is not so clear for me. Um, I suppose that he was uh, too much influenced by the French politics, uh, especially by Clemenceau, and then. Wilson returned in mid-March uh, from the United States. He became very angry uh, against House um, because of some decisions uh, he made in the commissions, etc. Also dealing with the Bohemian lands, and uh, he, uh, he then he more or less broke his his good relations before with uh, with House, with uh, Colonel House, but. I don't know who, who studied this uh, really exactly. Uh, I, never, I never found a book uh, on the relationship between uh, Wilson and Hoover. And, and, and House, sorry. May I just add, add a little bit on the food aid, just um, because you asked quite precisely about the difference that it makes. There is some research, I've done it with a colleague, where we look at the food, we, because uh, Clemence von Pierke measured all of these children in the kinder clinic here in Vienna, so it actually produces also very important research on the impact of food aid, mm -hmm. uh, and you see the children recover, so you can actually really prove demonstrably that the food aid made a difference. But the other side of this story too, which links a little bit to the house case, is the suspicion of American agency. There's always this expectation that Hoover will come back and save the world in the Great Depression, really, because he's the president and he is this great internationalist. But also at the time, there is this fear on the part of the Western allies that the Americans are because they're also sustaining the blockade initially while this food aid is going in. The Americans are doing this because they're trying to capture European markets. So actually, you continue to supply food in the war because you're selling stuff, you're lending the money, and then you provide the aid as well. So the French and the British are, are suspicious mm -hmm. of the aid. So it's a different side of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, just very briefly, because it's a subject I've actually looked into a lot, the, the ARA plays a tremendous role in Russia in 1921 and 22, alleviating the Volga famine, probably saving as many as 25 million lives. Wasn't a lot of gratitude, of course, from the Bolshevik side. Uh, the ARA was heavily infiltrated by the, the secret police and blamed for all kinds of things. Um, but it, it played it, it absolutely broke the back of that famine. Um, the, the Bolsheviks still, still used it as political pretext to go after the church in 1922. Um, but it's really interesting about the timing that uh, they actually told Hoover to slow down food shipments in February 1922 because the ports couldn't actually handle as much as the Americans were sending. Um, and that happened to be actually the same week that the last shipment of Imperial Russian gold bullion uh, was shipped to, to Stockholm to be laundered. And so the, they were both broke and being fed by the Americans, which just, I think, fed Bolshevik paranoia, resentment, and hatred of the capitalist world. Okay, Gus, we've got one here in the, I guess, one, two, three, third. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Well, I think she occupied a position, not to put too strong a point upon it, 
a little bit like Jehovah's Witnesses or the Dalai Lama. I mean, all the Vienna papers made fun of her, and they gave her the benefit of the doubt because she was the general's daughter and born Countess Kinski, and so all right, she was part of the clan. But no one took her really seriously. I mean, the, the crunch comes in 14 when even the party that's basically favorable to her views, the Social Democrats, are all gung-ho for war because it's against the reactionary Tsar. That's a progressive cause. And of course, conservatives say, well, we shouldn't want to fight the Tsar, but we fight the French Republic. That's a patriotic cause. So everyone has their special reasons to fight that very specific war. It's not a question of war or peace in your abstract terms. And the great sort of invention of the post-1945 world was not to persuade people of the benefits of peace, who always been in favor of peace, but to persuade American generals and arms pro producers that with mutual assured destruction, you can make money and have a career, and yet not fight the war. That's the best of all possible worlds. Hmm. Okay, we have a question. Uh, Colin Monroe, a retired British diplomat. My question is this, to what extent was uh, President Wilson and in Colonel House influenced in their approach to the peace negotiations by the emigre, well, or uh, immigrant lobbies in, in the United States, in particular, of course, in particular, of course, the Czechs, but also, uh, the, but also uh, the the Poles. So, I mean, the the. Uh Sorry. I mean, the answer to that is very, very significantly influenced by the presence of the, immigr of the immigrant communities. It's something that um, Wilson actually has to do penance for. What, uh, Wilson has made, um, earlier in his academic life, in one of his published texts, makes um, disparaging comments about American um, immigrants, as one would expect from Wilson, given his origins and family background. He has to do penance for that during the 1912 presidential election campaign when the quotes are cited back to him. And he um, has contact with immigrant groups almost from the moment that the war breaks out. Um, that is to say, it's something that he's thinking about with reference to his upcoming re-election campaign in 1916. Um, the White House is open for um, immigrant groups to represent themselves to the president, and he's interested in what they have to say. Those immigrant groups, especially um, Poles, Czechs, Slovaks, but also um, Serbs, Croatians, and um, also Hungarians. There are, uh, um, there's a Hungarian group as well that makes an impression on Wilson, thinking about to urge him to think about the role of Hungary as a national state in the post-war future. Um, they all have his ear. And one of the things that emerges pretty quickly for Wilson is that it's a little bit of a competitive zero-sum game for influence and that any concession that you make to a Polish immigrant group, you'll immediately be asked to make to a Czech um, group as well and then to a Serbian group. And he actually has to um, think in a very ecological way about how he wants to um, dispose of his own favor and presence and availability to these groups, which are, by 1917, by the time America goes to war, all in contact with um, various representative groups abroad as well, who are representing um, the political interests of those peoples in Europe. So the, that particular nexus between um, national committees in Europe, immigrant groups in the United States, and their joint attempts to um, lobby the White House, um, coexisting with, let me come back to this, the academic expertise that's being provided by the inquiry with reference to all of these groups becomes for Wilson a kind of crash course in educating himself about what's going on in Eastern Europe. Okay, Diana. Hi, Diana Mautner, nice to um, I had a question for Professor McMeehan. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, the question relates to the different treatment between the Kurds and the Zionists. And you had already mentioned that they had armed resistance, the Zionists did, and that they assisted General Allenby. I just wanted to add um, that they also spied for the British and that sure. there was a strong lobby in England supporting their cause. So in light of how the Kurd question is still lingering on today, I wanted to know what lessons could the Kurds take away and maybe get a better deal now from huh. the Zionists dealt with 
state creation back then? Well, it's a great point and, and a good question. I don't know if I have the answer to the question, but obviously the Zionists were very well connected. I mean, they had opponents, of course, but they were obviously very, very well connected in British foreign policy firmament, and you know, Lloyd George became something of a proponent as well. And yes, they were also spying you know, for the EEF. They had excellent contacts. Um, you know, they were, there, there were a lot of people inside the Ottoman Empire also helping to inform, the, the, whether they were spies or not. I mean, there are all these kind of informal contacts. Whereas that was the problem. The, the Kurds, some of it is just geography. I mean, they're, they, they didn't really have any easy access to the outside world. Um, at least some of the Armenian groups in Cilicia were close to the coastline, whereas there are very few Kurds in those areas. And so they didn't really have, let's say, like a line to Cairo. Uh, they certainly didn't have a line to London. And again, I just keep coming back to this fact. It's a little bit bad luck. The Armenians had similar bad luck when they backed the whites in the Civil War, but with the Kurds, it was even worse. I mean, the, the real ties, the only ties that had really been cultivated by a lot of these Kurdish tribal chiefmen were with the Russian Caucasian command in Tiflis or Tbilisi, and then by extension, St. Petersburg. Um, so the Russian imperial establishment, and even to some extent Russian academics, I mean, they actually had Kurdish language institutes in St. Petersburg. Um, there was a, a lot of institutional expertise, which just kind of went up in smoke with the Russian Revolution. So if there was anyone who was, in, I'm not even sure the Russians would have been that enthusiastic, but if there was anyone in a position to act as a kind of patron of the Kurdish cause, you know, it was the Russians. So, I mean, maybe that would be my advice to them uh, today. The Russians seem to know a bit more than the Americans what they're doing these days in Syria. Um, so maybe they should, uh, I guess it's not St. Petersburg, maybe they should go to Moscow. Well, remember the crucial thing we've learned is, were, were they at Normandy? <laughs> were they at Normandy, yeah. Well, yeah, in this case, yeah, the Poles were at Normandy. Um, but yeah, were the Kurds there on the ground with Allenby's army in, in Syria? Unfortunately, in an organized way, no, they weren't. King Abdullah Economic City, King Salman, Vision 30. Uh, my question is to um, p politi p political... support of, uh, of the help. Uh, my, my two questions. The first is one, the background of the history, so we are not accepted. So how we can construct a political base of support of the uh, future and uh, helping if it's France not accepted with, uh, how was his name, little Napoleon? He killed almost the uh, half world and how we will make police political. Peace political. I don't think that would help. <laughs> We've got another question back here, Nicolo. I'm Susan Perkins. I work as an English translator and teacher. I have a very simple, banal question, probably exposing my um, ignorance, but I'll ask it anyway, um, about definitions. Um, when does an armed conflict become a war? So what is the definition of a war? And by the same token, what is the definition of peace? For example, we had this very strange situation during the First World War. Over Christmas, for a couple of days, the two opposing sides crawl out of their trenches, smoke cigarettes with each other, sing a couple of Christmas carols, and then go back to the business of war. Was that peace, or was that like half-time in a football match? I, I will have a go. I mean, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult question. It's not banal at all, actually. I think it's a, it's a very pregnant question, especially in this period, because partly what everyone learns from the First World War is, is that actually, and, and Torsten Veblen, who's a member of the inquiry, he's a Norwegian-American economist, he writes quite extensively, extensively about the relationship between war and peace, not as absolutes, but as more or less. And that's not, that's partly what, of course, the First World War is like. There are periods where it's peaks and troughs, the number of belligerents moves in and out, the scale of the commitment changes quite dramatically. The British, of course, think they can continue with business as usual and wage war that will produce profits, and instead that's really the benefit that goes to the United States. Um, but the, the real blurring comes in the period afterwards, actually, where, and I mentioned it just very briefly, but it's really the substance of the two presentations that followed. In fact, there is war right across Europe, but it's not declared. And there are then experiences that follow on. So now, of course, it's not only that war's not necessarily declared, peace is also not declared, and you certainly don't write peace treaties anymore. 
So the practice of what we study now very rarely happens in the aftermath of a conflict. I come from, I'm half Irish, so I know there are places where it does happen, and then even there people are busy rewriting the terms of those treaties, probably as I'm sitting here. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, listen, we're on a very, very tight schedule today, and we're due uh, to resume in less than an hour at 2 p.m. with a very big topic of new visions of world order. So I suggest that we pause here for lunch uh, so that we have plenty of time uh, to get something to eat before we come back at 2. So let me thank again all of the panelists and thank all of you for your questions.